All right. Well, I think let's just go ahead and get started then. My my parents' clock has just chimed, so I think we're at officially seven o'clock at least in my house. So uh, just to let everybody know, uh, we are going to be recording this webinar, and uh, we'll post it to our GIS social media, our Facebook and YouTube page, um, probably here in the next couple of days. So if, if you want to go back and rewatch, or if you know someone who wasn't able to make it, just go ahead and let them know that it will be available to watch uh, in the future. Um, and then just a quick note, uh, we were going to we're going to do about the first 45 minutes, I'm going to give the panelists a few questions here, and then we'll save the last 10 or 15 minutes or so for a Q&A. So if you come across a question as you're listening to the webinar, um, there's actually a section down at the bottom of your screen called Q&A, and that would be the place to put any questions that you have that you come across. I'll be keeping track of those and I'll keep a list and then we'll um, I'll feed those questions to the panelists at the end of our time here uh, on the webinar. And you can use the chat that's over on the side just for any other side conversations that you wanna have uh, as well. Um, tonight, the, these are several authors from our, our latest social emotional learning book, which we're really excited about, just came out a few months ago. It's called Portraits of Music Education and Social Emotional Learning. And Darlene has a beautiful hard copy there to show everyone, nice, beautiful purple color. Um, and we are offering a, a promo code, and I'll put that in the chat right now, actually. Let me just make sure I've got that. It's Portraits 15, so it's 15% discount, and that's good through September 1st of this year. So I'm just going to go ahead and put that in for everybody to see. Um, and then just a, a quick kind of, uh, I guess, overview of the book. We had about, I think it was Scott, about 12 uh, teachers contribute to this and they range everything from elementary, middle school and high school. And they're teaching uh, general music, choir, band and orchestra. There's representation of all areas. Uh, and they've really each just contributed a chapter on how they utilize uh, social emotional learning uh, intentionally and musically in their classrooms. And so who we have tonight here is, of course, Scott Edgar, uh, who many know as kind of the, the name uh, behind the social emotional learning series through GIA. And then I'm, I'm joined this evening by Elise, Bobby, and Darlene, who also contributed uh, to this book in a very significant way. So I'm really excited for you all to hear how they, uh, you know, how they contributed. So before we get started, let me just give you a kind of a quick, uh, you know, two sentence bio for, for these panelists. Uh, Scott Edgar is Associate Professor of Music, Music Education Chair and Director of Bands at Lake Forest College. He currently serves as Director of Practice and Research for the Center for Arts Education and Social Emotional Learning and is an internationally sought after clinician on the topic of social emotional learning. Uh, Elise is an adaptive music and special education teacher in the northwest suburbs of Chicago, working with neurodiverse individuals from preschool through adulthood. Uh, the main focus in her research is training and preparation for accessible classrooms, and in 2018, she was nominated for the Illinois State Board of Education's Those Who Excel Teacher of the Year program, receiving an award of merit. That's excellent. Congratulations. Uh, Darlene is a Filipina American K through six elementary music educator and piano teacher in Southern California. She is passionate about creating learner centered spaces and challenging the status quo in music education and her experiences include designing curriculum, uh, directing studio music programs, leading professional development and training new teachers. And then last we have Bobby is in his 11th year teaching music and has taught choir at Round Lake High School in Illinois since 2015. He began using social emotional learning strategies with intentionality in the high school choral classroom over the last four years and has contributed to articles, webinars, and a podcast on the topic of SEL and music education. So that's just kind of a, a, a brief overview of who we're going to be hearing from this evening. Very excited. And I've got a few questions that I'm going to feed to our panelists, and they'll each have a turn to respond and kind of engage in a, uh, an organic conversation from those questions. And then, like I said, we'll, we'll uh, go check the Q&A at the very end of the session. So are, are we ready to get started, everybody? All right, great. So our first question is, uh, what is your unique contribution to this book? And uh, we'll go ahead and start with Scott. B before we do that, 100%, I'm not going to dodge the question. Don't worry. But there was something in the chat. Brian, they want to know who you are. Oh, they want to know who I am. Okay. 
I, I should have introduced myself. So I'm, <laughs> I'm an editor with GIA. I've been with GIA for almost five years now. And uh, I had the pleasure of being the copy editor on this book, in fact. So I've worked with, with all these folks uh, to, to bring it together. I think it, we were working on it back in the winter and spring uh, of, of this past year. Uh, and it was, a, it was really, really fun. Um, it was an excellent, excellent process. It turned out to be a beautiful, beautiful book. Uh, and I think there's something in there for, for all music teachers, regardless of what area you're teaching in. So, so that's who I am. We, we needed to hear that. Thank you so much. And, yeah. and you know, I, I saw it in the chat and there's none better than Brian. I mean, it was absolutely just a home run process. So hi everybody, Scott Edgar. Uh, this has been just, this has been what I've been looking forward to uh, this, because this is a space where we've been able to come together and bring together so many different voices to be able to hear what the process was like. Yes, the book, but how so many people have taken the buzzword and adapted it. And, you know, if you've heard me talk about the book before, I say what I love about this book more than the yellow book or the workbook or, or any of the other things that we've done is that these are the people who make SEL better. These are the people, these teachers who are representing the book and the other nine certainly all just rock stars in their own right and should be here to oh, we such a tough decision and when we look at the folks who are here these are the people who said okay so scott did this or you know i, I played with this or i heard this sel thing from some professional development and it didn't work and here's how i made it work here's how i made it better here's how i translated it here's how i made it organic and, and that's the most beautiful thing about this. The process of working on this book, the process of just seeing the passionate music educators come up with their words that just, it was inspiring for me. You know, I'm getting chills right now just thinking I am more proud of this product than any other thing that I've done. And it's thanks to the people who you see in front of you. So before we even get any start, uh, get any further into this, Bobby, Elise, Darlene, thank you. It is such an honor to share space with you today. All right, excellent. You want me to go ahead and repeat that first question there again, Scott? Sure. All right, yeah, that was, um, so we're just basically checking in, see what everybody's contribution was to the book. Yep, and so I had the honor of being the editor, where so it was my job to bring all of the authors together to find the right people to write the different chapters. Who was going to write a chapter on equity, diversity, and inclusion, and anti-racism? Who was going to write the uh, elementary general piece? Who was going to write the middle school piece? Who was going to write the high school piece? And who was going to write the chapter on how do we adapt social and emotional learning for all? And then it was my distinct honor to work with the authors to kind of craft what their chapters were going to look like. And the most beautiful thing out of this is so many of the people who are first-time authors, so many of the people who wrote these chapters said, you know, I, I want to do this, but I've never done this. And I think the greatest joy that I had was the day that it released, Brian, and I saw all the excitement on Facebook, and they were like, I'm an author. And it was just like, yes, that's what it's all about. So I had the distinct honor of being editor in this project. Perfect. Yeah, very, very exciting to see. We were, we were just discussing how exciting it is to hold like a hardcover book in your hand. And then, and then of course, to see your name on the cover. That's a really, really exciting thing. Um, all right, let's, uh, we'll go now to Darlene. So Darlene, can you tell us a little bit about your contribution to the book? Well, when Scott first approached me in writing something, I initially thought I would write, oh, eight pages, 10 pages. And it, I remember, I think the first draft was close to 40. <laughs> and so I thought, oh gosh, I need to kind of cut down here because there was just so much to say. And so my contribution was um, the introduction. And it was all about looking at how to see SEL through a culturally responsive and specifically anti-racist lens. Um, and not just for our black, brown, indigenous, and Asian students, like I think some people think, oh, we have to be culturally responsive because I teach students of color. And then the most common question I hear after that is, oh, but what about, you know, my mostly Caucasian students? I said, no, this is for everybody. And I mean, I just felt so much honored to have my writing be at the forefront of it so that everyone sees SEL through this specific lens and not to be confused with you know, finding specific SEL lessons through this lens, but at least have it at the forefront so that you could start to um, question any narratives that, you know, 
maybe end up being a culture clash with some students. So that was my contribution to this book. Excellent. Thank you so much, Darlene. It was a fantastic introduction. I had a, I had a blast reading it and working on it with you. Uh, let's go now to Bobby. Yeah, so I was in the high school section, um, kind of high school ensembles, and I, was, I teach choir. So uh, I think the focus of mine was really to think about how do we use SEL through repertoire, um, not you know, set aside activities, although we use a couple, um, but thinking about how do we re-envision um, our lesson plans through the music um, to teach SEL. Excellent. Thank you, Bobby. And then, of course, last we have Elise. So my, what I kind of brought to the table here was looking at the ways in which we adapt SEL and the ways in which, you know, initially when we talk about SEL, it doesn't meet the needs and challenges of all of the students that we have, and especially disabled folks aren't necessarily included in the narrative. So what I did was I took all of the incredible chapters and work that all the other authors put together and kind of put in a, a couple other ways that you can think outside of the box to continue to ensure that SEL is accessible for all of the students in your classroom, whether it be a kindergarten elementary music classroom up through high school choir band and orchestra. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And Elise's chapter was really excellent because she took, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you took um, uh, plans from the other chapters. You would actually take an example from, you know, Bobby's chapter. You would say, here's a really great, um, you know, uh, uh, idea that you can use and here's how you can then adapt this for for these types of learners and I thought that was really excellent because it's just extremely practical uh, for readers. All right, uh, we, I think we can go on and move on to our second question unless anyone had anything anyone on our panel had a response to anyone else. Probably not for this first question. Um, so here's our second question, which is, what was your greatest challenge this past year uh, and how did you utilize SEL to help so we'll start with Scott again. There was no playbook for last year that I think that was the greatest challenge is that all the rules that we had learned and that we had been students of and that we had figured out what were the processes and the product, the playbook was thrown out the window. And I think that was the greatest challenge. I mean, I think the biggest phrase that I can give to the last academic year, but even just this last stretch is there was always something. There was always something that the second that I felt like I was getting my head above water a little bit, whether it be professionally, whether it be personally, whether it be our society, whether it be the divisiveness, there was always something that the second that I felt like I was getting ahead, I was getting knocked down. And so to say, you know, what was the biggest challenge? I think it was the unpredictability of and the inability to be as resilient as I think many of us are used to be. I don't know about others, but I know I have been far less patient just in my own life, just to be able to navigate so many things, just because our fuse is so much shorter because of everything else that is piling on. And you know, in my professional life at Lake Forest College, uh, I literally on day three of teaching ripped up the syllabus and I said, this isn't meeting our needs. This isn't meeting the need. The needs have changed. And so I literally ripped it up and said, here we go. And based everything in what, you know, adult SEL saying, what do we need to position ourselves to better understand what the challenges that are coming at us. And through that modeling, how social and emotional learning was gonna manifest in uh, with our college students, but then serving as a model to how it will feed in. And I firmly believe that when we do SEL, when we do SEL, and I, I, I know every single person on this call will agree with this, SEL isn't something we do to, it's something we do with. And when we do SEL with, we gain so, much of a space to reflect ourselves that as we're engaging with the process we emerge with these skills right along with our students and we emerge with this understanding right along with our students so i think that was probably the most profound journey that i was on is that amidst it's always something that the lesson plan wasn't the most important thing great thank you scott darlene so growing up my mom um, she had a daycare at the home, and I also have two younger brothers who are about a foot taller than me, and I'm five foot, so it's kind of not fair. 
But because, you know, I've grown up with, you know, my little baby brothers, and then I would grow up with these little kids, my mom would teach this little song. And a lot of Filipino families would know this. It just goes, close open, close open. It's just helping with their hand coordination, sometimes with their eyes. And I remember being on Facebook and seeing one of my Filipino friends post the lyrics to that song and say, this is what the pandemic feels like. And I'm like, this is so true. Everything is close open, close open. And just the pull back and forth of everything was, I felt like the biggest challenge. And I think right before the pandemic, I felt like I had planned all of 2020. And I mean, like many of us, even 2021, everything. And just this last year, I just basically said, I don't know about everything. I mean, there's this even this TikTok audio trend where it was just dun, dun, I don't know, dun, dun, I don't know. And that was just me, like, I don't know about everything. And so it was definitely wrestling with a lot of uncertainty and realizing there are just so many things we cannot control. Now, um, in regards to at least this past school year with my students, I was virtual the entire year, um, as opposed to some schools that were able to go back in person, things like that. But I just went full through March 2020 to June 2021. So to say I'm Zoomed out <laughs> is kind of an understatement, but I'm so glad to be here. Um, but what I've realized is like the inequities that we've had in education, oh, they were so much more amplified. I mean, yes, we were all trying to figure everything out as we were going, but every time we come up with one sort of solution, then we go, oh my gosh, you have to think of this and this and this and this. And so that was very eye-opening, not just for me, but I believe for a lot of us. And then I think it was, I had a choice. I had to sit back and just complain and pull through, or I had to sit back and think, this is eye-opening for a reason, and what do I do with this? What do I do from this learning experience? And now that I look back, I see a lot of conversations saying, oh, I can't wait to go back to normal, like can't wait for normalcy. And I'm thinking, I don't think I want to go back to normal because normal is the status quo. Normal is continuing to have these inequities happen. And I mean, I mean, inequity is such a big word because I mean, I could go on forever about that. But I think we need to challenge ourselves when we say we really crave being normal because who's whose stories are we leaving out when we say things like that? So that's definitely the challenge that I encountered throughout this past year. And now I'm looking forward to what will happen this upcoming year. <laughs> and I think we'll get to that in our next question. So we'll look forward to hearing about that. So uh, let's hop over to Bobby now. Yeah, well, and I agree with so much what Scott and Darlene said. And on top of um, having to do school in a totally new way, um, I think the biggest challenge for me was not having reliable feedback from students. You know, normally we sing and I hear right away how it's going. And this year I might hear later that day uh, if they'd submitted the recording assignment, um, but I probably didn't hear it. And so trying to um, plan for that and then react to it took so much longer and was so uh, much less rewarding because um, I think a lot of us are in teaching to get that student interaction and you take that away and you're just doing all the parts of the job that you don't like, <laughs> um, like grading and emails. And um, so missing that student interaction was huge. And so I think we kind of utilized SEL to reimagine how we connect with students because we realized in our department that we, we had to have that student feedback, but we had to get it in new ways, you know? So, as we're trying all of these new things, asking the kids like, hey, what's working? How is this comparing to your other classes? What are you know, things that you need from us? And a lot of times that was shorter, a little more engaging and fun assignments um, and a chance to talk with their classmates. Um, but really, you know, we lost all our expertise of how teaching worked. And so we had to rely on the kids to help us learn how to do online school. Great. Thank you, Bobby. And then Elise. I'm going to do a little silver lining with this one too, because as we, as we were talking about, you know, a lot of the challenges and inequities that we've seen, especially with a lot of my students, seeing, physically seeing their home life is something that we don't get to see in a classroom. And when you have a student 
who is with six other siblings learning together in one room, sharing one hotspot, you learn a lot, right? And, and that's what SEL is all about, is really understanding your students and their identity and your connection to them. So reshaping the way in which not only what we're teaching and how we're teaching it, but in which we can have them feel safe in that space when the reality is that they may not be in a safe space for them to be able to learn was one of the most challenging things. And I'm going to go in, off on a little story, but a lot of my students utilize devices to speak. That's their voice. And being fully virtual this year, when a student's parent mutes and walks away, they don't have a voice anymore because they're using eye gaze to communicate and I can't hear their device, right? So seeing voices being taken away literally from students was a challenge that I'm still learning to overcome. And I'm still working with teams to figure out how can we set this up so that students can be successful, knowing that even though my district was kind of back and forth this year, a lot of them are gonna to choose to stay home because they have some pretty severe medical needs. On the other end of that though, I've seen students who have really been challenged in school because school isn't necessarily the safest place for them. They need a space that is a low sensory zone where they don't have to engage in some of the norms that we've set in our society and school systems. And being on a screen has been awesome for them. And I hope, as I know we're gonna kind of transition to talk about next year, I hope that next year we keep that in mind that we really all have learned to adapt and we've seen how truly inaccessible some things can be, but we've also seen ways to adapt and make things a little bit more accessible. So I'm gonna to continue to challenge myself to grow and learn more about accessibility in really out of the box ways as we push forward. Yeah, thank you so much, Elise. Anybody have anything to contribute to this question before we move on? Just two seconds, Brian. Just always inspiring to hear teachers and and when we feel like we don't have anything else to give i think that one thing we found and, and was just heard in all of these testimonies is that we're not the only expert in the room and when we realize that that the space opens up for so many more opportunities and i, I think that was a moment for my own personal just when i realized that i didn't have to have all the answers that when we're in doubt ask the students um I, I, what Jerry just typed into the chat, I think was pretty powerful. Jerry wrote uh, a lot about leaving last year there. And I think what we just heard was just so profound that, yes, we want to leave last year there, but we want to understand that the residue of last year is going to come with us, that there's going to be pieces of last year that we need to learn from. And I'll, I'll throw another buzzword in there, and that's trauma, that many of us have been big T, small T traumatized by last year. And how we navigate that past is going to inform how we navigate this upcoming year. And if we ignore it or if we just say last year was last year, give me three months and then I'll figure it out after Labor Day. Well, there's going to be some mental health residue that's going to come with us on that one. Thanks so much, Scott. Okay, all right, uh, question number three, and uh, it's about more about the future. How do you plan to utilize SEL this fall to help move yourself and your students through the transition back? So we'll, we'll jump back in with Scott there. You, you know, I, I think that it is the, for me, it's the only path. And whether we call it SEL or whether we call it relationships or whether we call it trust <laughs> or whether we call it any other thing that feels organic in our world, you know, one of the things that I, I have been just shouting from the rooftops is needs before notes, that the, the interpersonal and personal needs that are going to come with us in the mental health crisis that we're going to be encountering not only this fall, but for the foreseeable future as an artifact of the missed milestones of the isolation. And, you know, as as has been so eloquently said, we've all experienced this last year from a very different standpoint. Ever, as many people as we've talked to have experienced this differently. And that all has to be acknowledged, that all has to be front and center, that all has to be put in a space where we are listening louder than we're speaking. And you know, as, as Bobby said, if, if we go right back to what it looked like pre-pandemic, we will have missed the lesson. We will have missed the lesson. And I think that the trick here is that we don't see that as lowering a standard. We don't see that as sacrificing tradition, that we see that as adapting our profession, that we adapt our space and our practice to meet as many people's needs as we can. And I think, as Elise and Darlene both said, that if one thing has come abundantly apparent in the last little bit is an awareness that 
we understand that many people's needs are not being met. And I believe that when we approach it from understanding our identity, facilitating a sense of trust and belonging together and amplifying student voice through agency, that that is our path to rebuild trust and that that will get us to a space of meaningful music making uh, and, and deepen that music making uh, when we get back together this fall. Perfect. Thank you, Scott. Darlene? I think when it comes to using SEL specifically for ourselves as teachers is to really understand our identities and not just, oh, I'm a Filipina American woman living in Orange County, California. Like, okay, that's just one very small aspect of our identity. We have many different positionalities, like our gender, our religion, our our immigration status, class status, different things like that. And I think we need to be aware, constantly aware of that and how that is compared to our students. And that's something I'm going to try to do more, especially at the beginning of this year, is of course, build relationships. But building relationships is more than just, okay, tell me what Marvel movie you've watched recently, but also getting to understand their identities and not just understanding them and knowing factual knowledge about it, but what do you do with that information? How are you taking that data you're collecting about your students and running with it for the entire year and not thinking, oh, cool, I have a bunch of Taiwanese students. Oh, I won't amplify them until May because that's Asian American uh, Pacific Islander month. No, you're going to use that information all throughout the year. And not just also taking that data, but also affirming their identities too. And I love what Alice Soy also does in um, in her school where she starts off um, each of her classes like, affirming the students and the students would say these affirmations and I think just that repetition is so powerful for those kids because who knows what kind of words they hear beyond the classroom you know on the playground from their families and who knows maybe your classroom is the only chance where they get to say I am enough like I am I am loved just as I am. And I mean, I know some people might go, oh my gosh, it's so wishy-washy, but I think if we put ourselves in the shoes of a child again, it is that it is powerful for them. Um, I think another thing to think about is, especially if our student demographic goes through experiences that we have not experienced, I think that's something that we need to step back and go, okay, I can, I can read all the things, I can read all the articles, go all the webinars, but it is not the same as actually living through it. And I feel like for that, that's when it comes talking to people, talking to adults who totally grew up in the same or similar circumstances as our kids, because reading statistics and reading articles is just the very surface level. And that's also someone's perspective too, rather than someone who has actually gone through poverty or has actually gone through culture clash and that's what I brought up with Scott when I first read his book I would read through and go something doesn't feel right like these are great activities but they remind me of so many times when I would walk in a classroom full of students that didn't look like me and I immediately did not feel like I belonged and that's another thing we got to think about is more than just, I'm going to diversify my repertoire. I'm just going to make sure I appeal to all the cultures in my classroom. But how do we ensure that our kids really do belong? And maybe that's something that we have to sit and wrestle with. And I mean, I'm excited for that. I'm excited to see more of what my students will offer and how I will see more of their identities play out in our music class. Thank you, Darlene. Let's, let's hop over to Bobby. I just want to toss it to Elise real quick. And then I'll- right. put in the chat and I asked if it was okay because you said something that really resonated with me. Absolutely, please go ahead, Elise. It was about cutting Scott off. Um, no, it was, <laughs> that, that's exactly how I felt, Darlene, too. And a big challenge for me, and I haven't really talked super openly about this, is getting a diagnosis this last year for autism for me, which is something that just the way society is, we could talk about that in another webinar. It's a whole long thing, but- not only having students be able to use their voices in that class, you don't know what they've been able to say, period, outside of your classroom. So they may be, again, in a house where they're not able to use their voice at all. They may be in a space where they have siblings talking over them, and not only can they not hear good things, like nothing, you know? So we have to establish that space where they, we're not only supporting their voices, we're not talking for them, we're talking with them. And for me, when I'm coming back to the school year, 
I want to see my students be part of those lessons. I don't want to be creating lessons for them. I want to be creating lessons with them. I want them to be in charge of their education. They know after this year what they need. They're, they might show it in ways that we might deem unexpected or behaviors, but they're communicating it to us. So we need our students to be there with us along the way, designing the education that they want and deserve. And now Bobby, please, sorry. For yeah, <laughs> well, so, so good. And I, I agree. And I guess I'll add on to that. Like, as we transition back, not only considering like general characteristics of students, but I'm trying to remember that we're all coming back as different people than I even knew before, you know, like, and I was reminded when we came back to school in March, you know, I had both positively and negatively some kids that maybe before remote learning were super um, shy and they came back as the end of their senior year and they were confident and ready to go. And it was inspiring. And other kids that before um, the pandemic had been bubbly and, um, you know, energetic and were a shell of themselves and super just like everything body posture like in and recognizing that we have to, you know, relearn kids and, you know, learn a bunch of new kids, learn about a bunch of new students too. And um, I think that's going to be really hard, you know, not making assumptions about the kids we already know also. Um, and so I think I usually do some like get to know you kind of stuff at the beginning of the year, but I think I'll kind of reframe it as like a, hey, I know you guys, some of you know each other, some of you might be new, but like put that frame on it. We are all coming back as different people. We have different and sometimes terrible experiences from the past year and a half. Um, we've had a number of students whose parents have been seriously ill or died and that there's so much there. Um, just trying to open up some space is like, hey, you get to reintroduce yourself um, and finding activities through our music. And, um, you know, there's some great ones in the book. I'll go back to plugging that. Um, the, in Brandon's chapter, um, like a kind of musical playlist um, and Sanders chapter with the musical driver's license, um, just ways, kind of short units at the beginning of the year that we can use to get to better know our kids as a reintroduction. And something I did um, as a transition back was just focus on more interactive warm ups. And that's pretty simple. Hey, sing this warm up to your neighbor. And like you saw a kid go from totally closed off to like, oh my gosh, a person is looking at me. Um, and that was new. And starting small and kind of building from there as we transition back. Great. Bob can I jump in right there? Because what Bobby just said was you, you, part of what we, we just champion and believe is that music itself is going to be part of this transition, part of this healing. And I think oftentimes we can forget that and we can for think that this is about social and emotional learning. Yes, but it's about the unique role that social and emotional learning plays in the music classroom. And how can music be part of that space? We believe that music has healing properties. We, we, we would all find a story in our own life that that resonates with. And you know, when we look at our individual teaching context and what that looks like, music is going to be the space that we're going to bond around. It's going to be that connective tissue. It's what our students miss. So when Bobby's talking about the students coming back and yes, they are the physical beings that they know and that we don't know. I think one of the biggest things that we need to remind them of is that music education, our music classrooms, that's the constant that that's going to change. That's going to morph, but music's going to, we're still going to remind ourselves and our students that we love music. And I think that's going to be part of what's going to be so healing about this fall. Thanks. Thank you so much, Scott. Elise, did you want to, did you want to hop in there uh, just to kind of directly address this question or did you feel like you already did that? I'll just throw another, another quick little piece. And sure. really, I think when we think about SEL, especially for a lot of my students, it really is like the, the how behind the goal. We have that shared goal. And when we're creating music, we all have that same goal and shared goals are what bonds us together. So when I think about how I'm going to establish next year, it's really how are we going to meet our goals and how is that going to set our shared goal as a music classroom? How are we going to be able to achieve the goal that we have for ourselves and how does that fit in with kind of the bigger picture? And that's really what I have set, like 
I, I don't care as much about the standards this year. I know it's, I can't say it, but I don't, I don't care. I often really don't care because they're making music and it doesn't matter how they make music, they're making music. And all music is valuable music and reminding them of that, even though maybe they haven't sung in a year, maybe they haven't sung in a year and a half. Maybe they haven't picked up their instrument because they were scared their brother was going to break it. All music is valuable music. And even if our goal is to pick it up and play it together, that's the goal. And we will get there together. Perfect. Thank you so much, Elise. And I'm just going to hop in here really quick and say that this is the last kind of um, pre-written question that I have for the panel. So if as you've been listening, you've had some questions rattling around, go ahead and put those in the question and answer now so that I can start compiling a list for our last 10 or 15 minutes here. So uh, to the panelists, our last question uh, here is, how do you utilize SEL in your music classroom to elevate student voices? and prioritize student empowerment. So let's go ahead and start with Scott for this one. Yeah, and I, I'm really curious to hear, especially the wording of that question from the other, uh, the other panelists, because I think it's just essential. And these are things that I'm trying to listen very, very loudly so I can hear is that empowerment isn't ours to give. It, it, when we give empower, when we say we are empowering someone, we still hold that power that empowerment is what happens when we take a step back and allow more air in the room and the students that space when we have that wonderful moment of saying i don't need to micromanage every second so i, I i'm going to just listen really intently when, when our, our friends are speaking here but in, in terms of what it means it means that i don't have to have the scripted lesson plan that i have i become more of a facilitator i become a teacher in a way that maybe I have five minutes that I'm going to drive content. Yes, I'm the content expert. That doesn't mean I'm the only expert in the room. And that the direction of the class is as unpredictable as it can be. And that organized chaos is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And if I walk into a quiet classroom, I really worry about why that classroom is quiet and what that experience is being had for those students. All that put together, uh, you know, I, I was just watching, my wife and I were watching a wonderful series. For those of you who may subscribe, I'm not product placing here, uh, but Disney Plus has a wonderful series called The Secret of Whales. And uh, in that series on the last episode, it said, a, a marine biologist said that behavior is the what, culture is the how. So much of what we prize about music education and what we do in our classrooms is a about still centering it on music, but changing that how. Having that youth empowerment piece, not at the end, not as an afterthought of, oh, how are we going to empower students? Because that's what I, how I started uh, this answer with, but more, how can students be with us every step of the way? And how can we listen? And how can we, you know, this is the definition of being culturally relevant, culturally responsive, is meeting our students' needs. And one thing that hit me over the head like a frying pan this year, was that students needs changed from minute to minute students needs changed from day to day and to say oh i'm going to be culturally relevant by writing a syllabus and going that direction or programming that concert well that 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 syllabus is relevant for day one or minute one of day one and that it is all about adapting it is all about having our finger on the pulse of what our students are needing. And if there's a day that the notes and rhythms aren't happening, that's okay. That's okay that the end goal of music education is not notes and rhythms. Thank you, Scott. Darlene? Yeah, I mean, we're all saying just awesome, awesome things here. I know, Elise, you were saying earlier how, you know, all music making is valid music making. And I kind of want to take that a step further because I feel like some people can say that and nod their head and go, oh, yes, you're right. But then they still worship DWG, Dead White Guys. So I kind of want to touch more on that for some of the people who still don't really know what that means. Um, I think before we even think of elevating student voices, then you have to think about whose voices are really being told when you're choosing your repertoire, when you open up your textbook too, because my entire life, I never knew a Filipina musician even existed simply through my music education. Um, I had to go on the internet or go on social media to find them myself and it, they were there. 
they're just their stories were just never told so i think i also think of so many transfer students i get especially with fifth and sixth grade and in the past that that time is when we were usually digging deep into rhythms and notes and i would just watch those students and they have would have never had a music education before and they would just go they would be completely lost and i feel like that's definitely not what we want our students to feel like and so and it's not just you know notation and things like that but it's also the kind of music genres and styles and musical learning styles that we welcome i mean i have students who are very familiar with um, mariachi i have students who are very active in playing in bands in the church and it's unfortunate sometimes when i hear actual teachers say okay i know that's how you sing at church and at home but we sing this way here in the classroom and okay so then that's when you immediately are not culturally relevant that's when you immediately put a dent in the relationship why yes you are f f you know doing your specific objective for that day but then you've already kind of damaged the student relationship there and then when that kid grows up their go their musical education experience is going to be based on memories like that um and so i think I mean, I really hope that people listening here aren't like that. But I also encourage you all, if you do hear any of your colleagues say anything like that, like, this is what I do. It's like, well, think about how a student will feel because kids experience music, not just in our classrooms, but outside our walls. And for me, I think of the bigger picture, too, with SEL and music is I think of, well, elementary music is required for my students they choose to do music in middle school and high school it's an elective unfortunately it should be a core arts but or it should be a core standard but well that's another subject for another day but i think oh goodness i have such an advantage to really create that joy and to affirm that for them and if my musical experience isn't relevant and if they can't connect with it, they see no connection with the music they love outside our, of our classroom walls, then how do I expect them to continue on? People say, okay, like I'm having problem with recruiting. And then I think, what about what you teach in your classroom? Maybe, maybe it's not just a scheduling issue. Maybe the real issue is the kids are basing off their musical experiences from the experiences they have in the classroom. And so that's what I think we have to think about first before we think, oh, we gotta empower our students is, okay, but do our kids see themselves in what we're teaching? Thank you so much, Darlene. Bobby? Yeah, wonderful. And um, I think part of that for me is I have to check my own ego. Um, and I like, I've for years, especially with like, treble choirs where, you know, it's 50 young women and then me, um, I'm like, hey, I'm, a, I'm the only guy in the room, like, tell me about this, you know, and so we've had those kinds of discussions. And I think the past year has opened my eyes and a lot of people's eyes in different ways. Um, but trying to check our ego at every step of the way, you know, like, um, and how can we get student feedback to check that? Um, and it's, it's not calling out one kid in front of the class and saying like, hey, is this working for you? But it's developing those relationships in the hallway and after class and um, you know, providing different ways for kids to give us feedback, written, verbal, otherwise, um, so that we can check in uh, and make sure that, that they're feeling comfortable and hopefully catch it early. So if we need to change something, we can. Um, and kind of the way I was thinking about integrating SEL in student empowerment is looking at a traditional thing we do and trying to look at it from every angle. And so I thought about like repertoire selection. Um, I tend to think of that as like the director does that, like that's my job. Um, but lately I've been trying to almost develop like a menu of like, okay, so if a choir is going to perform three songs, maybe there's one that I'm like, yep, we're going to do this one. But then there's four or five or six that kids get to choose from. And so they've got a choice in the selection. That can be scary. Um, sometimes I don't think they pick the best thing, um, but you know, having some flexibility for kids to say what they wanna do. Um, there was a concert before we went remote that um, 
I couldn't think of a third song, but earlier in the year, I had asked kids for their feedback and they told me what they wanted. The group decided, and that was the piece um, that the choir connected the most with was the piece that they um, had you know, chosen. Um, and we always do that for like our spring pops concert, but I'm gonna try and do that a little more throughout the year. Uh, and then as we're working on repertoire, like can I have a very a variety of ways for kids to give feedback of how they're learning it and how the rehearsals are going? Um, can kids have some more ownership about the musical decisions that we make? Um, and again, to reference the book, um, Sandra Lewis in the orca high school orchestra chapter had a great um, activity for this. Um, and then, you know, monitoring our rehearsal pro progress. Um, I put a big chart up on the wall of, you know, learned, memorized, polished. How are you coming? Kids get a chance to assess themselves and their classmates. Um, but trying to look at, you know, a traditional thing that we might think is director centric. I decide what we rehearse today. I decide the music and thinking, well, is there a way that kids have more of uh, you know some more input in in those processes. Great, thank you so much, Bobby. Elise. Yeah, I, I honestly had a train of thought, but then I got distracted by a comment in the chat, so I'm going to address that first. Um, I think it is so interesting what you said, Monica, because I hear that all the time, especially and and I actually hate the word special ed teacher, accessible teacher. Um, so many people believe that SEL is for people with disabilities, and truly. It's like anti people with disabilities, um, which is why we're trying to work on it because it, it's teaching people how to be normal in a classroom when we're talking about like looking at a picture and understanding how this person and Scott and I've had talks about this and you know there are so many different ways to look at something from various perspectives, which is what's at the heart of SEL but the way in which a lot of our teachers are checking off the boxes is not for people with disabilities. It's actually like anti accepting people for who they are and appreciating differences. So just gonna say that for a moment, but um, kind of with what you were saying, Bobby, feedback actually like really is everywhere around us. And especially after this year, we've been talking about how students are totally gonna change and have been changing from one day, one minute. They're giving us feedback and communicating with us and everything that we do. And, and for me too, it is taking a step back from my ego and saying, oh yeah, like that student is totally communicating this thing. And it's it, maybe it's because of their body language or maybe because it's not, they're not participating or they really loved this song and all of a sudden they're totally dropping out at this song. Or, you know, there's a reason that there's those changes happening. And that is my feedback to, okay, whether it is or is not working, that's my feedback. And kind of going from there, that's the communication that they're giving. So I think when we're talking about student voice and empowerment, recognizing that they are communicating with us. They are giving us feedback every step of the way and using that to drive our instruction. And whether they're verbalizing it or not, using that to continue driving our instruction is, is the number one way for me. Perfect, thank you so much, Elise. Does anyone else on the panel have, have anything to contribute to this last question? We're, we're getting some good Q&A questions coming in and we've only got about 10, 15 minutes left here. Brian, so, I, I, I just want to chime in because Elise, you and I were right there on Monica's comment in the chat. And, you know, the term that I'm hearing bantered about right now, and it makes my skin crawl is SEL kids. Uh, and I, I'm like, who, who, who are you talking about? We are all SEL kids. And the, the comment that you made, at least that just knocked it out of the park is, you know, something looks really good on paper, but in practice, are we really living up to that potential? And are we really utilizing it for its full ability to do so? Uh, SEL is for you, Brian. It's for me. It's for Elise. It's for Darlene. It's for Bobby. SEL is for all of us and the skill sets that we bring to the table and the needs that we bring to the table. And it helps bring us along in our own individual space and then connects us with each other. Uh, if I can diverge for just one second, Brian, uh, so many good questions. Just understanding that you know the, the magical thing that I found, the light bulb moments that I found in SEL are when we start with that individual and the space for individual reflection that becomes so powerful and we understand that identity and only then are we able to develop the sense of belonging this community that we're craving for as a world as schools as classrooms but if we don't start with that individual appreciation and understanding and, and all of our different manifestations of diversity 
that that is special, unique, and we are elevating and honoring cultural differences. That's where I think we're going to see some real headway moving forward. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, okay, so we've got uh, a few Q&A questions coming in here. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of direct them either to everybody or if I think it's directed to just a specific panelist, I'll let you know. But we had one that came up about maybe 30 minutes ago. Uh, and I think this one might be a good question for Darlene to address, just because if I remember correctly, you discussed this in your introduction a bit. And um, here's, what, here's what it says. It says, what do you think the difference between the armchair glasshouse approach from a teacher that has not experienced socioeconomic or physical trauma pre-COVID versus a teacher who is a trauma survivor? Uh, and are you aware of the harm that can be caused when SNL is used incorrectly or as a weapon against students? Hmm. Do we have time to do a second edit to this book so I can add <laughs> another chapter? <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, I think, okay, this is a very interesting question and I'm, I don't want to take too long answering it, but I think as teachers because this is the time well first of all we should be resting because it's summer for a lot of us so we should be resting as much as we can and then we start gearing up for the new school year when we start seeing these webinars and these conferences and different things like that we really got to look at the bios of these presenters if they talk about certain things like culturally responsive pedagogy and then i go but have you ever felt like you've been assimilated being, you know, going through assimilation in the music classroom or trauma informed, but they don't have any personal stories. And I think we really need to elevate the power of personal experience and personal stories as much as academic research and things like that. And so that's just for us as the teacher consumer, um, because we can, do, again, like what I said before, we can do all the research but we really got to hear from the people who have gone through it themselves. And because what they say from their experience could be totally different from what we see from um, academia or from articles or books and different things like that. So I don't know, does anyone else have anything to add onto that? Go ahead, Bobby. Um, so the SEL as a weapon comment uh, stuck out to me. And um, I, to me, SEL is all about intent. Um, and then you've got to follow up with hopefully good intent with like making sure you're, you're doing it right. But um, I think one of the best things Scott says is starting with that self-awareness. It's not starting with the self-management, right? If we're looking for like, oh, this is a good way to manage the kids, like that is not the goal. Um, you know, for me, it started with feeling overwhelmed because I saw that there were students that had needs that I didn't know how to meet. And I was looking for strategies and SEL happened to be a, you know, a general teaching strategy philosophy that could help students and help me get to know students better. Um, but it was never about like managing them. It was about, you know, learning more about them, helping them learn more about themselves, but not trying to make them conform to my idea of what um, good behavior looks like. Thank you, Bobby. Elise, did you have something you wanted to chime in there just, with? Just saying, because again, Bobby, like, what does good behavior look like? Just like you said, what's good behavior? But again, do we have a second book, third book? So we'll get there. <laughs> Perfect. You, you know, just I, I want to address just very quickly, because I think oftentimes we look at it as a construct, we look at it as research. And th there are so many people who are out there who are saying, yes, but what does the research say about the value of SEL? And to me, the you know going back just to the purple book the purpose that we're here today is that's research that's bringing together 12 people's stories who are encountering very different settings very different spaces very different gifts very different perspectives with students with diverse needs from different experiences that's the research we need that's the research that we need to be centering around we need to hear what this looks like in the classroom where teachers and students are coming together and doing this really magical work otherwise yes intent and, and intent matters and precision matters especially in our words and in our intentionality with this and when we approach it with that perspective and you know i put this in the chat but i think oftentimes this is also an artifact of how sel is being implemented in many places 
And that's where it is this scripted tool that we give teachers and we say, read from this card and experience this as part of its morning meetings or, or homeroom. And yeah, that just doesn't work. That doesn't work. That takes away the teacher agency at navigating what SEL looks like in their classroom, which almost inherently negates student agency. So teachers need to approach this with a space of saying, this is what SEL means for me. This is what SEL is happening in my classroom. This is the social and emotional wealth and capital that we are already building. And SEL is nothing more than a way to give it some words, to give it a little bit of language to make explicit what we've made implicit for a very, very long time. Perfect. Thanks, Scott. We get we keep getting more questions coming in. So let's uh let's see how many we can get through. We'll do like a speed round here. Um, here's a good one from Missy Strong. She said, is there something about SEL that you think is misunderstood by the general teaching public that needs to be clarified or redefined? I think we've kind of we've kind of addressed it a little bit, but maybe just a quick 30 second, 60 second answer. Scott, you want to take it? Or Elise, Elise? I was just going to say, we were talking about it's for the, the SEL kids, right? And kind of the checklist of it's for how we behave in class, how we behave in front of others, and how we make good decisions in school. It's kind of taking the three tenants and turning them into school systems. And I think, Heidi, with what you just posted about PBIS, too, people are using SEL as if it were PBIS rather than in place of PBIS. SEL is what PBS should look like, right? It's really understanding the root of why people are doing what they're doing, what makes them who they are, and utilizing that as part of who we are in our education system. Whereas PBIS is, you know, sometimes it's that positive, it's supposed to be that positive behavior, but it's giving out, you know, a token economy system where the kid who's behaving well in school is getting all the candy at the end of the day, and the kiddo who is focused in their own way is not. So I, I personally would say SEL in place of PBIS or model your PBIS using the tenets of SEL rather than how good behavior should work in school. And I think that's kind of a misconception, especially in the elementary schools that we have. Great, thank you so much, Elise. Scott, did you have anything you wanted to chime in there with? What Elise said was perfect. Okay, great. Here's a question from Morgan Dunst. Uh, it says, as a new teacher this coming fall who had a very interesting and maybe abnormal student teaching experience and is feeling a little lost in terms of what our classroom can really look like, what advice might you give me and other new teachers in their first year uh, for, for SEL? Bobby? Um, so I was actually a little jealous of first year teachers in that, um, you know, everybody in the whole profession feels like we got torn down to the studs basically and have to start over. Um, and the advantage of that is that you're reminded of like why we got into this in the first place. And it's less kind of about ego. It's less about how many years have we been doing this? What have we done before? It's you have to focus on what's right in front of you. Um, and so I think it, that can be an advantage. Um, and, um, you know, so I'm just looking for your question again. It disappeared. Oh, I'm sorry. It's in the answered column now. I clicked. Oh, like, okay. Um, just advice for a new first year teacher with SEL. Yeah. So, you know, it would be that use that, um, use why you got into teaching, you know, connecting with kids. Um, there, nobody has the answers because we're all relearning. And so, um, you know, go to the, the most basic level. How can you help kids become more self-aware? How can you learn about them? How can you work on their social skills and, um, and decision-making? Um, and so um, it's almost like a, a fresh start we all need. Um, so I don't know if that, I, I had a full head of steam and then totally lost it. So if somebody <laughs> else wants to jump in. Appreciate that, Bobby. Yeah, anyone else? You know, you know th this is the world that I'm living in, in terms of how do we help our students get through four years and, and help them get ready for day one of a profession. And, and let's just own it, that that's the goal of teacher education is to get them through day one. And then everything else is the experiences that we learn once we're in that first uh, that, that first position. 
I, I think what we need to do to normalize, I think what we need to normalize is that experiences have been missed and we need to advocate to our administrators and our districts that there is a robust professional learning agenda for every student who's going into the profession, that the traditional model may not be there. But I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that the teachers who are entering the profession now are entering with an increased sense of empathy, an increased sense of grace, and an, uh, a prioritizing of the relationship. And there's been some early, early pilot work that I'm doing, uh, looking at some teachers who were in burnout mode. And, they, they, you know, I mean, we, we could ask the group right now, how many people have you uh, are, are close to burnout right now or were at some point this last year? And it's 100 percent. And the answer is not necessarily calling it SEL, but when you start to prioritize the relationship and when you start to build that community, it brings us back. It brings us back to remind us the why and the teachers who I'm working with who said, I'm out, I'm done. And then just that quick recentering of the why. Well, it's the kid. It's not the music. It brings them back that passion, that understanding, that moral compass of why they got into it to begin with. Thank you so much. I've got two more real good questions I think I'm going to pose to the panel and then uh, and then I think we're about out of time here. So the first one, this is directed to Elise. Uh, Elise, do you have any workshops and or resources available on adapting and using SEL for neurodivergent students? I will say I think uh, Elise's chapter in the book is an excellent place to start. Uh, and then Elise, take it away. Yes, I have that. Um, I will be teaching a session at the Arkansas ACDA um, the third week of July specifically for choral students, but it will work for everybody. Um, some systems that I use also just email me. I like to talk. So I really will talk about anything. Um, and I have a couple um, children's books coming out too for your classrooms that will have embedded lesson plans for neurodivergent learners, for all your neurodiverse, meaning everybody. And then you'll get some lesson plans there too. And really we can just chat because I like to chat. My favorite thing is taking what you're doing and helping think out of the box that way because what you're doing is already great. Let's just help it meet more people. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elise. And here's, uh, here's uh, I think, kind of our last real good question. Oh, someone was asking for your contact information, Elise, just so that they have your email. Okay, great. Perfect. There it is in the chat. Uh, last question is someone says, so I've been told that I'm not a good teacher because I'm not a mother. If I don't have that personal experience, can I ever really be a teacher in SEL or research SEL or marginalization or present songs to my students that are not from my culture? Anyone want to tackle that? First, tell me who this, who said this, and we'll, we'll find them. I don't know. I don't know. It's from an anonymous attendee, so I don't see oh, a I name. I meant the person who called. Um, oh, oh, oh! I see. I see. Who would say yeah, that? Like, yeah, like. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I thought. I thought. I thought maybe the interesting part to address would be uh, teaching teaching materials from a culture that is different than mm -hmm. one's own culture. Got it. Well, I I can answer that. Is we we got to get rid of the idea that we can be the only teacher in the room. Um, being culturally responsive and culturally relevant is also building relationships with your school community. And if let's say you have a family um, who is very involved with mariachi, you don't have to be the one to teach it. You can have them come in and teach your class. And so it's finding who you already have out there and having them be a part of your classroom too. Um, or even, I mean, we're so lucky to live in 2021 where we have the internet and Zoom. And so if you see somebody on the internet and they're doing virtual performances, have them maybe do a workshop. They're, we don't have to be the only ones in the room. And so I think we should definitely take advantage of the many resources that we have out there. And yeah, that's how I would approach that when it comes to finding things that we're not well versed in. Great, I really appreciate that, Darlene. Did anyone else have anything they wanna to contribute to that? Yeah, I just wanna jump on that too. And as, as we're trying to really get our admin from somebody who's doing their admin degree right now to understand what's going on with SEL and the way that we wanna teach it, it's those of you that like use the Danielson model get evaluated, it's in there. It's, it's totally in there. And especially when you can bring in parents from the community to come take a music class when you can bring in siblings to come play, when you have your concert and you say, okay, 
we're going to send home recordings and everybody at home can teach their families. And then the last song we're all going to play together. That's, I mean, that's your evaluation right there. That's your four. So it's great for you. It's great for your students. It's great for your community. It's great for everybody. The more people that can be involved in education. And I know I briefly mentioned, um, Darlene, you were talking about something prior when it was like, that's what you do at home. Home culture and who we are at home is part of our school culture. It has to be because it's our identity. We can't belong. We can't have this community if our identity isn't part of that. So bridging the gap as much as possible between that home culture and that school culture will make a world of difference. And you will not only have kids showing up, you'll have their younger siblings so excited to be in your classes in the future. You'll have parents there ready to play with you who may not have picked up their trumpet in 20 years and are super excited to be playing with you. So the more people we can get involved, again, music is communal. Music is valuable, no matter who's playing what, no matter how good it sounds, it's, it's gonna be great because it's valuable. Put a cowbell in everyone's hands, says Scott. Perfect, thank you so much, Elise. Uh, I think I think we've officially run out of time here. Really, really great questions from the attendees. Uh, Scott, did you have anything you just wanna kind of say uh, just in conclusion here, last last minute? This fall is all about relationships. This fall is all about building our communities together and building them better and understanding that our students are at the center of the equation and not music. That music's going to be our, mortal, uh, our, our portal. It's going to be the way that we are going to do this, but it's about the relationships. And that means building relationships with your colleagues who may not understand that the relationship is the number one thing. It means building your relationship with your school counselor, with your administrations. And the more that we are divided, students feed off of that. We need to understand that our relationships start, and it does start with adult SEL. It starts with adult self-awareness. It starts with understanding how are we going to unstick some of the thoughts that are just embedded from these last really, really tough times so that we can move together stronger. So uh, I would like, from my perspective, to thank GIA and thank you for the space to be able to put this in. And as always, when I have just the honor, the privilege to be able to share space with uh, Elise, Darlene, and Bobby, uh, I, I feel like I learned so much. So, so thank you to the three of you for, for you know, accepting this invitation and, and just such an honor. Thank you. Yeah, and thank you to everyone who attended. I, we've been keeping uh, an eye on the chat. There's been some really spirited and enlightening discussion happening over there. So thank you so much for being engaged and involved. Thank you, of course, to our panelists for being here tonight. Uh, it has been really, really wonderful discussion. And I think everybody will take a lot away from this. So as I mentioned at the beginning, this will be up. It's uh, being recorded. It'll be up on GIA's Facebook and YouTube, as well as on our soundboard, which is uh, soundboard.giamusic.com. Uh, you can find this video there as well. Uh, so with that, I think we will say good night and goodbye to everyone. Thank you so much for joining.